Blessed be the one holy and living God. Today's hymn is Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. Let us pray. Grant to us, Lord, we pray the Spirit to think and do always those things that are right, that we who cannot exist without you may be enabled to live according to your will. Amen. I ask your prayers for all who live in the work in the borough of Pottstown. I ask your prayers for all who govern and hold positions of authority, especially the may mayor and borough council, the governor and the president. I ask your prayers for all whose lives have been touched by tragedy, whether by incident or by deliberate act. I ask your prayers for the sick. We pray for all suffering from the COVID-19 pandemic and for all risking their lives to care for others. I ask your thanksgivings for those celebrating birthdays in this part of the week. Philip, Kirsten, Emily, Eric, Mr. Diagardi, Ms. Dahlhoff, and Dr. Courtney. Almighty and eternal God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, mercifully accept the prayers of your people and strengthen us to do your will. For your name's sake, amen. Our speaker this morning is Julia Weiss. Julia is a three-year boarding student from Manhattan, New York. She's head prefect of Upper School East, a member of the crew team, and captain of the varsity girls ice hockey team. She's also the proud roommate of Poppy Oden. Julia? If we really think about it, Every single day, each and every one of us puts ourselves in a position of vulnerability. As a result of this, we all subconsciously trust each other not to take advantage of this vulnerability. For example, as I'm standing here speaking to all of you, I am perhaps the most vulnerable person at Hill in this moment. Just in the next two hours, there are over 500 people that I'm giving the opportunity to judge what I'm saying, what I'm wearing, how my hair looks, the sound of my voice, my message, the list goes on. My vulnerability is quite literally showcased for all 500 plus of you to see. On the other hand, I am putting my trust in all of you that my vulnerability will not be exposed or taken advantage of. This isn't as extreme of an example as it seems, but the premise of this relationship that we all have with one another right now during this chapel talk, whether we personally know each other or not, exists in every aspect of being a human being. Over each term, the girls hockey team and I, along with a few other varsity winter sports, had the absolute pleasure of spending five weeks on campus with each other while intensely practicing our sport. One thing you may not know about the girls hockey team is that we spend the majority of our off ice time working on skills and concepts that don't really have to do with hockey at all, but more so have to do with being a good person, a good teammate, and a good member of the community, as well as how to effectively build relationships with the people we meet. During one of our Trust Thursday meetings, which is basically a specified day of the week in which we specifically focus on the skills I just mentioned, Mr. Baum gave one of the greatest speech speeches I've ever heard. In fact, it was so extraordinary that several of our players were deeply moved by what he said. His main message was, relationships should go in both ways in terms of what you get out of it, and both people should be committing equal effort and time into the relationship. Otherwise, there's a chance you won't get everything you can out of life. 
I myself have spent a lot of time since that day thinking about what he said, how to translate it to my everyday life, and more importantly, how to best share it with all of you. Most of us throughout our lives create numerous transactional relationships. In economic terms, transactional relationships are based on exchange of money, goods, or services. They serve a very clear and direct point or purpose, and when that purpose is no longer fulfilled, the relationship ends. The easiest way to think of this is our relationship with material things. For instance, our relationship with a desk is simple. It serves its purpose to us as a place we can work on. Once we don't need it anymore, we get up and leave. We forget the relationship we had with it in the first place. This is a transactional relationship. These relationships extend to every person we interact with. All of our relationships start out this way. In some cases, our relationships with teachers or fellow peers are strictly transactional. Both parties fulfill the terms of the transaction and then move on. Arguably, the exchange I described in the beginning of this talk relates to this relationship. What I need from all of you each time I walk out of my dorm room is the same as what you need from me, grace and mercy for the vulnerability we both carry, AKA trust. But transactional relationships are not the last stop on the train. What really hit us all while Mr. Baum was talking was how to understand and create the difference between transactional and transformational relationships, ones in which we focus more on the message rather than the task. And with that being said, I now begin the true message of this talk, empathy. The ability to understand and share the feelings of another. Over the last three years, primar primarily as a member of the girls hockey team, this is a word I have heard a lot. If anyone knows Miss McConney, you know that this is her second favorite word and one that she connects almost everything back to. When I ask people if they understand what empathy is, their response is typically along the lines of, oh yeah, empathy, duh, I know what that means, sympathy, but just a little bit deeper. As prefects, we're told to approach situations regarding our prefectees with empathy, to put ourselves in their shoes. While I think the majority of us, both students and faculty alike, understand this concept, I don't think we have actually processed how important and impactful this idea is. And I personally think the majority of our flaws and issues as a community and as a society stem from the lack of comprehension of what it means to be truly empathetic. Empathy is what unlocks the ability to turn relationships from transactional into transformational. We can't focus on the message if we don't have the emp empathetic strength to do so. The good news is, this is something that everyone is capable of achieving, if we care enough to practice it. We can't fake being empathetic. It has to start in the way that we think and approach things before it can appear through our actions. We have to be intentional about it. You show me empathy when your inner thoughts give me the benefit of the doubt. When you say that it was courageous of me to stand up here and speak to all of you, even if you didn't like what I had to say. You show me empathy when, instead of saying that you don't like the sound of my voice, you first think about how there is absolutely nothing I can do about it, and if someone had said that to you, it would probably cause you to speak less. Therefore, instead of not making the comment simply because you shouldn't, you refrain from making the comment because you are able to empathize with me and truly understand what the consequence of your words will be. As a result, you have now realized the message beyond the simple task of not speaking that thought. You and I have created a transformational relationship. This practice is hard. If it were easy, everyone would do it, and we would be one big happy family all across the globe. And so I ask you, who do you want to be? We all innately want the same things, and for credibility purposes, I'd call myself an expert because I learned about this in psychology class. We all want to be loved, respected by others, and to have a sense of belonging. That is ingrained in us as human beings. How ironic is it that we are the only opposition to our deep-seated human needs? I find myself asking this question a lot because it is simply something that I can't really wrap my head around. It's not just about being nice to one another because we all don't have to like each other, but we have to respect each other. We have to understand that each and every one of us has feelings and is only trying to live their life just like you and me. As a school, we talk a lot about building bridges and creating relationships that will transcend this campus, 
that will carry us into the real world so we can be effective, efficient, and contributing members of society. We cannot do that without the ability to understand and share the feelings of another. Instead of making fun of the kid who doesn't play much because they're not that good, realize that at one point, whether it was five years ago or three months ago, you were once at the same level as they are. Who are you to judge the story that Maimuna or Poppy or Lal or Gabe or anyone else shares? To tell them that they're wrong or to talk poorly about them behind their backs because they open themselves up to you, because they expose their vulnerability. What right do you have to comment on the way someone dresses, on their loud and bubbly personality, on the way they get excited when they talk about a book or a song or a TV show you've never heard of, but think it sounds lame and weird? What you think is lame and weird could mean the absolute world to someone else, something that holds deep sentimental meaning to them and you just stomped all over it with your judgment. The common excuses we, he excuses we hear are, oh, I didn't know, or it was just a joke. These inconsiderate justifications will never be good enough. They will never undo the damage that your words have already done. You don't need to know someone's history or what they're going through to go easy on them. Knowing is not the key to unlocking the door to being empathetic. Actually, it's more so the other way around. Before I came to Hill, I attended a high school in the lower part of Manhattan and played on a travel club team based out of New Jersey. My days were quite busy. I would leave my house between 7.15, 7.30 in the morning, go to school until 3 p.m. where I would hang out around till about 3.50 when it was time for me to get on the subway and head to Penn Station to catch a train into New Jersey, where one of my teammates would pick me up and drive me to the rink. Some days, I even had to bring my hockey bag to school and drag it with me all the way into another state. From there, I'd spend about two to three hours at the rink, get picked up whenever practice ended, and finally arrive home again around 10.45 p.m. This was at least three days a week, almost every week. I wouldn't start my homework until about midnight after showering and eating dinner, unpacking my stuff, and mentally preparing myself for the hours of work that I still had to do. I don't think I got more than five hours of sleep any school night that whole season, which lasted from July to about mid-March. On top of the physical stress that my body was under, my sophomore year was one of the worst and hardest mental health years I've gone through. To summarize something that doesn't deserve to be put so simply, because it's just so much more, I truly didn't think that I was gonna make it to this day, much less to the end of that year. I feared going to sleep because I feared waking up. The way I saw it, every tomorrow was a toss up and the constant battle between my ears and behind my eyes consumed every part of me. My daily schedule wasn't exhausting, but living was. Now, I don't say this to ask for sympathy or for anyone to pity me. I pride myself on my ability to seem like I always have everything together, staying on top of my schoolwork, making it to every practice and game, being social and making time for my school friends, or for all of the factors that come with being a functional and contributing member of society. Pretty much all of the time, I seem fine. But especially sophomore year, I had everyone fooled, and I was really good at putting on a show. I had only opened up to one person in my life and years of trapping myself between walls and pushing people away proved to be paying off. No one asked questions because no one had suspicions and maybe that's where I went wrong. I thought for a long time that I deserved all the inconsiderate comments and backlash that I received from my friends and family. I thought that being classified as the dumb one who made stupid comments was more often, and was more often than not spoken over or not acknowledged at all because of the reputation that I had was the reason I had friends on the team. And so that was who I ought to be. I thought it was wrong of me to listen to the music I listened to or to have other friends that I spent time with because the people I hung out with at my high school told me my hockey friends were annoying even if they have never met them. Things that happened the night before which made me happy and excited Things that I wanted to share because they were important to me were stupid and were ignored. I was lame and fake if I couldn't go out after school because I had to catch an hour and a half train, and I was insane or inconsiderate if I asked my parents for a ride there. Little did anyone know, weeks and months of these piled up remarks destroyed any drop of confidence I ever had. Sure, I had friends, but deep inside, I felt like I was surrounded by strangers. 
my relationship with the one person I did connect with who offered a handout and never once retracted was seen as weird. And people who had never met her and still haven't to this day didn't like her because of how close we became. It didn't matter if they knew her or not. It was strange to them. And that was enough to degrade the best thing I had at the time. Unfortunately, my story is not a rarity. All around us right now are people with their own struggles and battles. We all know the sayings, treat others how you want to be treated, and you never know what someone is going through behind closed doors. But so often do we forget that these apply every second of our lives. You don't know how that one comment you make is going to stick with someone. It didn't matter that they were my friends and I loved them. The things that they said were engraved in my brain, haunting me as I lay in bed at night, echoing in my head every time I opened my mouth to speak. In fact, coming from people I loved and depended on hurt worse than coming from a stranger. When I came to Hill, I swore to myself that I would do everything possible to approach everyone I met from a place of genuine empathy, so that no matter what, people with problems or burdens ranging from big to small, no one would feel how I felt. Sure, I can relate to those who have had similar experiences to me because I myself have been there in one way or another. Therefore, I can empathize with someone because I can share and understand their feelings. But have I ever had a close relative pass away, like a parent or a sibling or a cousin? No. Have I ever lived bef below the poverty line? No. Have I, ever have I ever been severely bullied as a kid and had to continue throughout my school life carrying years of fear and trauma? No. But I still empathize with these people. And so can you even if you haven't experienced any of those things. And I will tell you how. Because at some point, you have struggled too. Because at some point, if someone had said the wrong thing to you, it would have sent you over the edge. Because we all have different experiences, but our experiences are rooted in things that we all share. A handful of emotions and desires that all of us, as human beings, are born with. Take your experiences your own thoughts and feelings, recollections of how it felt when you were beaten down or felt all alone, and use those to connect with others. Use it to share and understand how someone else might be feeling. Give them the benefit of the doubt and cut them some slack. For better or for worse, one comment, or lack thereof, could be the difference in that person's day, week, month, or even lifetime. Of course, we may not have a way of actually knowing the impact we make, but the trust we exhibit in each other is what that relationship and interaction, even if only brief, transformational. I think, if not, I think most, if not all, of the adults at the school would agree that adopting empathy as a top quality is one of the most important and worthwhile quests one can ever go on. If you don't mind, I'd like to challenge all of you, students and faculty, to spend just one day thinking about this. Throughout your day, think about everyone you encounter, all that you say and do. Be conscious of the thoughts that you have and ask yourself, how can I apply empathy to this? I think what you will find is that you can apply this to almost everything. I think you'd be surprised to find that if you truly think about this concept, you will start to see people differently. You will appreciate them for who they really are you will develop a sense of love and caring for them even if you don't really know them, simply because they are a fellow human being who wants the same things that you want, acceptance, understanding, and a feeling of belonging. You will find joy and satisfaction in realizing that you can give that to them. We can give that to each other. Empathy is not a political issue, regardless of race, religion, gender, sexual orientation and identity, cultural or economic background. Stripped down to our bare bones, we are all the same. We are all human and we are all part of humankind. I'm not asking us to be perfect and walk around giving out free hugs and loving everyone. Again, we don't all have to like or love each other, but we have to approach each other with empathy. Start now, because if not, one day you'll wake up 75 years old, surrounded by a bunch of receipts from all the transactions you made wishing you could have transformed them into something more. Thank you. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Mm -hmm.